It is Tuesday, January 2nd, and this is The National. Tonight, Iran is trying to stop the world from seeing images like this. Protests throughout the country. We reveal why that won't work. Two little boys missing in the dark, in the bitter cold. How a BC community came together to find them. But we begin with a Canadian man who was once held hostage in Afghanistan, facing serious charges here at home. You may remember Joshua Boyle and his wife, Caitlin Coleman. They were taken hostage by the Taliban and held for five years. During that time, they had three kids. Their rescue last fall by Pakistani forces made international headlines. Tonight, Joshua Boyle faces 15 counts, including sexual assault. Katie Simpson has the details on the charges. Police arrived at Joshua Boyle's apartment around 11 o'clock on Saturday night. Neighbors say officers searched the perimeter with flashlights before going door to door to ask questions. I just came out because my dogs barked and um, I saw the policeman and I asked what was going on and they didn't answer. Okay. <laughs> they didn't tell me anything. Court documents show he's now facing 15 charges, including assault, sexual assault, unlawful confinement, uttering threats, public mischief, and causing someone to take a noxious substance. Not much else can be reported because of a publication ban to protect the identity of the alleged victims. The family is not making any statements to the media, posting this sign on their door tonight asking for privacy. But Boyle's lawyer tells CBC News his client is presumed innocent and he's never been in trouble before, adding, we look forward to receiving the evidence and defending him against these charges. The alleged offences took place, according to the documents, sometime between Boyle's return to Canada and December 30th. The reason that we were kidnapped. Boyle's family has spoken publicly about the challenges they face after surviving five years as hostages. They've done a range of interviews, including one as recently as Friday with the BBC since settling back in the Ottawa area. They also sat down for a private meeting with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in his office, but few details have been made available of what they discussed. For now, Boyle is being held in an Ottawa jail, with a brief court hearing set to take place tomorrow. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Boyle and his American wife, Caitlin, were kidnapped while backpacking in Afghanistan's Wardak province, a Taliban stronghold. I'm not sure I ever did want to go to Afghanistan any more than I wanted to go to, wanted to do other things in life. During more than five years in captivity, Boyle says his family was moved between 23 different locations near the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, often in the trunk of a car and frequently drugged with the anesthetic ketamine. They were held in huts, abandoned homes, underground dungeons. Coleman had three children while being held captive, and Boyle says his wife was raped by their abductors. They will take reprisals on our family. They will execute us, women and children included. Their captors said the family would be held until the Afghan government stopped killing Taliban prisoners. But it was a rescue operation by Pakistani military this past October that finally led to their release. The men who have made all of this possible has actually made our second day even better than our first day of tasting freedom. Adrian, we've been watching those protests in Iran as they grow for days now, and so, as it turns out, is the U.S. government. Uh, you bet, Rosie. The Americans, I mean, clearly seem to sense some political opportunity mm -hmm. here. Iranians, as you know, heading into their seventh day of these deadly anti-government demonstrations. <laughs> Those are protesters clashing with soldiers on the streets and tearing down posters of the country's supreme leader. Since Thursday, at least 21 Iranians have died in clashes. Hundreds more have been detained. But as Paul Hunter explains, those protesters are gaining more support from a loud and powerful voice. Choose your place in Iran tonight and you'll find rage in the modern capital, Tehran, of course, but now as well in city after city after city. Iranians angry there are no jobs, blaming a corrupt government, challenging leadership they find infuriating. Iranian security forces have hit back hard. 
But demonstrators, undeterred, continue to target not just political symbols, but even those of Iran's supreme leader. Ayatollah the murderer, they shout. It's a remarkable time in Iran, prompting the Ayatollah himself today to respond. Blaming the violence on enemies of Iran. And though he didn't mention the U.S., Donald Trump weighed in anyway, tweeting, the people of Iran are finally acting against the brutal and corrupt Iranian regime. The U.S. is watching. Though despite Trump's words, it's not as if Iranians haven't protested before. Massive demonstrations followed the disputed elections in 2009. Back then, the Obama administration was criticized for failing to do more for the protesters. Today, Trump's ambassador to the United Nations said she'll soon call for a U.N. emergency session on Iran. The people of Iran are crying out for freedom. All freedom-loving people must stand with their cause. I think the ultimate end game would be that the citizens and the people of Iran are actually given basic human rights, and he'd certainly like to see them stop being a state sponsor of terror. Offering support, but leaving things in the hands and fury of those on the streets of Iran. For now. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. The Trump administration also called on Iran to unblock social media accounts the protesters are using to organize. But like hugging the wrong diplomat, mentioning Instagram may just make the situation worse, painting a bigger target on the app. Social media is a big part of life in Iran. So the question is, can the government really stop the sharing of information? The Iranian government would prefer imagery like this not get out. That's why Instagram and Telegram were banned. But the world sees what it does because tech-savvy Iranians find workarounds. They're strategic because the government is. Look at a map of Iranian web traffic over the last few weeks. Nothing stands out since the protests. No wholesale shutdown or blockage. Internet Freedoms researcher Masa Ali Mardani says assaults are precise. It seems like they're focusing on the mobile operators because that's how people, you know, they're out on the streets and they're connected from the streets as opposed to being at home and being connected. So by going after mobile operators, then does that sort of stop people from trying to organize on the streets or report what's happening on the streets? Yeah, I think it's, it might be a little bit of both. Ali Mardani, fiercely protective of net freedom, says all Iranians, even the elderly, are steady users of basic internet security for their own safety using virtual private networks that fake an IP address to make it look as if you're in another part of the world, and Tor, which bounces addresses around to confuse. These tools help, but increasingly, the government is going after them too. Iranians are sending out real-time reports of what is getting shut down, and developers globally are responding. How are they responding? They see, oh, this uh, version of my... Um of my software is now being targeted by Iran, so I need, a, I need to develop a new version for Iranians to use. And is this happening quickly? I mean, are people seeing a report, you know, on a Tuesday morning and, and working through the afternoon and, and the evening to get a, an update? Yeah, I think their developers are working on uh, providing these tools. Subversion is always dangerous, but for those worried Iran will go dark, Ali Mardani says have a little faith in Iranian ingenuity. I think the information will flow. Um, I'm not worried about that. Uh, I mean, things might get more restricted. Uh, I'm confident Iranians are going to find ways around it. Their will is to find a way. Now, Donald Trump was back on Twitter again tonight, once again, threatening nuclear war with North Korea, writing, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un just stated that the nuclear button is on his desk at all times. Will someone from his depleted and food-starved regime please inform him that I, too, have a nuclear button, but it is a much bigger and more powerful one than his, and my button works. So just let that sink in for a moment, Andrew. I know you're going to be keeping an eye out for reaction to that and more tweets tonight, I suspect. But now you're looking at the impact 
of all those extreme cold temperatures that so much of the country is dealing with. Yeah, that's right, Adrian. There was a, a miscommunication in Toronto about whether homeless shelters were full. An investigation has been launched into that. And with those uh, frigid temperatures, complete strangers stepped up, arranging hotel rooms with their own money. People could freeze out here in a very short period of time. And we live in one of the wealthiest cities on the planet. And if we cannot take, the pe take care of the people who can't take care of themselves, who will? Now, though, outreach workers and activists are demanding answers and accusing the city of fudging the numbers to save money on beds they don't use. Ali Shiasong explains. Toronto's shelter system is overburdened. City politicians know it. People like James here live it. Very stressful, very stressful. To keep his cot at this winter respite site requires dedication. You have to be in on around quarter to seven after supper to uh, sign in for a bed. There's 30 beds. Otherwise, he runs the risk of being out in the cold again. Yeah, we had a couple nights outside. Yeah, park, Massey uh, down the hall, Massey Hall down under the concrete. City officials say Toronto's 62 shelters are at 94% capacity. But now, communication breakdowns between those looking for shelter and those helping find it for them have raised serious questions. This is activist Doug Johnson. Yesterday, he called the central intake to ask if there were beds available at the city's newest emergency shelter. They're filled up at the Better Living Center? Yeah, yeah. There's no place for me to go tonight except for down to Pierce Street to sleep in the lobby there? At the moment, yes. We walked down there and the Better Living Centre said they could take people. The experience was enough for Johnson to accuse the city of penny-pinching, saying that the city pays third-party-run shelters a per diem for the beds that are filled, not the ones that sit empty. They don't release a bed, then they don't have to pay for it. There's no intentional gaming of the system there. To the city's general manager of shelter support shot down that idea. He says if people need space, they'll get it. It's very dynamic, so those beds fill and become empty regularly through the 24-hour period. The city's ombudsman and Raftis are vowing to figure out what went wrong in these frigid few days. And councillors want answers, too. On that issue, the communication piece, I think the activists have a, have a good point. There is a lot at stake here, and this is why the emotions are so high now. Emotions are high. The stakes of being turned away are even higher. Ask James. And they'll leave you in there for a half hour or whatever to, to warm up and then they'll give you a token and try to send you somewhere to get a bed, right? But yeah, it's really hard, really hard. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. We want to tell you a bit more now about how volunteers ended up shining a big bright spotlight on the shelter problems in Toronto simply because they wanted to help their neighbours stay warm. I was on Twitter at about 11.30 uh, on the 30th of, no of December, um, saw that one of the intake centers had, had uh, posted that they had nowhere to give people to go, um, and reached out to my network and said, listen, I'll pay for a hotel room. If others can contribute, we might be able to cover some people for the night. And uh, over the past couple of days, over 100 and I think we're at 136 pledges now have come in of rooms. And we've gotten 18 people into rooms over the past couple of days. Um, and it's been amazing to see what's happened. One of those people in Jennifer Evans' network put her in touch with a local restaurant owner who remembered the many people who helped get him on his feet when he came to Canada from Lebanon 18 years ago. Mohamed Faki paid for the bulk of those first hotel rooms. The two strangers found they shared a similar sense of gratitude. I'm warm. <laughs> I have, uh, I have food, I have the ability to know that I'm going to wake up in the morning with a roof over my head, and there are dozens of people who not only don't have that, don't know if they're going to be able to stay inside tonight, and that's just inexcusable. Now, the group says they're not sure how long the hotels will be needed, but they say they'll check in every day. Now, one silver lining here is that the number of Canadians using emergency shelters has been declining over the years. Almost 20,000 fewer people are using them in 2014 compared to a decade earlier. But there's still an incredible strain on the system. On average, emergency shelters in Canada operate at more than 90% capacity.
Meantime, on New Year's Eve, sub-zero temperatures put the lives of two little boys in B.C.'s interior in very grave danger. Police and search and rescue volunteers scrambled after the parents noticed their young sons were missing. It happened in Vernon, about a five-hour drive northeast of Vancouver, far from the urban homeless, but face-to-face -face with exposure in the wild. Briar Stewart tells us what happened next. It's over there. Yeah. Lee Pearson and Daniel Hoekstra are back where they spent a very tense New Year's Eve. It began with a phone call to Vernon Search and Rescue saying two boys were missing. Not quite the panic button, but close to it, uh, especially when I heard that they were so young, five and seven years old. Especially considering the conditions, it was minus 18 and the area was hilly and dense with trees. Searchers headed out into the night. Hawkstra was on a snowmobile and went down a trail until it came to an end. We hopped off our snowmobiles and we had a look around and we found one set of uh, child's um, boot prints in the snow. We uh, yelled out their names and we could hear a very faint scream or cry back to us. They walked for another 150 metres into the bush until they found them. Both boys were hyper hypothermia, uh, really, really cold. The youngest boy couldn't walk, so we had to carry him out. His feet were frozen because he had taken off his boots when he got snow in them. The older boy then told the rescuers just how they got lost in the first place. They went out into the bush to uh, get some wiener sticks for, uh, for, uh, for a roast they were having, and they saw a deer, and they just started chasing after the deer. By then, the boys had been outside for more than three hours. As they headed back down the trail, Hawkstra radioed the command post with the good news. <laughs> Family and all the neighbours were there, and I just announced that we'd found them, and everybody just started crying. It was a very emotional time, and for us too. Um, there was lots of searchers with tears in their eyes, too. Place work, guys. Thanks. It was still hours from midnight, but it was a New Year's Eve celebration they won't ever forget. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. <laughs> so we can tell folks that the boys are home safe tonight, but boy, uh, it can be disorienting to be out in that kind of extreme cold for that long. Yeah, and I, I have to say, given all those hard things that, that, that the search and rescue workers see every day on nights like that, that is going to be sort of rocket fuel for them for the next little while, knowing that, you know, sometimes it does end well. Lucky, lucky boys, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and still ahead on The National, small movements, huge impact. We'll show you the technology that let this mother and daughter have their first conversation in 21 years. Plus, democracy, peace, and regular citizens were threatened around the world by hackers in 2017, and it could be worse this year. I recently sat down with an international panel to talk about that. Our conversation is just ahead. And a cross-country tour with an unusual religious relic. David Common finds out what it takes to travel with, yes, that is an arm, an arm. Someone's gonna ask. Other passengers what's, are gonna say, what is that? What's with the, what, yeah. What do you say then? Well, we'll tell them, of course. We'll tell them, you know, this is an extraordinary opportunity for Canada. On the National Tonight, a devastating scene in Peru after a coach bus plunged off a cliff, killing at least 48 people. It happened north of Lima on a notoriously dangerous stretch of road called the Devil's Curve. Officials say it appears the bus collided with another vehicle and then fell off the cliff onto the beach below. Like all these vehicles. Oh, man. Some bad winter weather made for a deadly day on the roads in New York State. The massive pileup you see here happened on a major highway near Buffalo. One person was killed and another was critically injured. Officials say about two dozen vehicles were directly involved in that crash. Meanwhile, in BC's Fraser Valley, crews are still working tonight to restore power to everybody. It's been five days since a series of ice storms knocked out electricity right across the region. At the worst of it, more than 100,000 customers were in the dark. BC Hydro says it hopes to have the lights on by late tonight, but today has also brought new power outages. As of right now, it's a work in progress. We admire him. It's like having a hero. It's like having the Stanley Cup come to your 
your Timbits tournament or something. Like, the Stanley Cup is coming to us. So it's someone we've admired so much. He's so cool. Who is she talking about? He's not a rock star, movie star, not even a sports star. Francis Xavier is a real saint, and he's about to embark on a tour of Canada. Well, a small, well-preserved part of him is anyway. Our David Common has more on this centuries-old human relic set to draw crowds right across this country. <laughs> It's not every day your patron saint comes for a visit. Inside this duffel bag, at least some of that patron saint, this is Francis Xavier's right arm. In Canada, for the very first time, 465 years after he died, Where's the rest of them? Goa, India. Goa, India? Yes. Why there? Well, that's the main place he did his ministry. Angèle Renier knows all about St. Francis. Take a moment and ask for the powerful intercession. Her Catholic Christian outreach organization engineered this visit. Who is somehow mysteriously present to us. The arm, a relic for the Catholic faithful, considered uncorrupted from normal decomposition testament, they say, to Xavier's exceptionalism. The arm has only left its home in Rome a handful of times. And if you wonder how a patron saint flies, well, this time it's by Air Canada, the relic picked up by the Archbishop of Ottawa. And it's remarkable that it's in the condition yeah, that it's yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And people are fascinated by it. And some are repelled by it and some are attracted by it. Archbishop Prendergast understands if not everyone wants to see the arm up close, but as it begins a rare tour of Canada, 75,000 people are expected, and that makes it very valuable. Well, we have to keep watch over it. Uh, we also have to make sure that it doesn't get damaged or stolen. Uh, we have it insured for that. Like, how do you fly? Well, the relic itself will have its own seat on the plane, from what I understand, beside me. It'll be Darcy Murphy's job to watch over it. How do you explain carrying part of his body as opposed to just reading about him in a book? I, th I think what's cool about it is it's, it's that physical encounter. So it's, it's, a, it's more than just um, reading about him. It's something that's still physically present. Like, it's, it's literally his arm. The same arm said to have converted and baptized 100,000 people, mostly in India. That was very profound because this is the scene that converted my ancestors to Christianity and if it wasn't for his mission in Goa, I wouldn't be here today in Canada practicing out my Christian values. To some, this will all seem a bit strange. To others though, it is a remarkable experience. An emotional one too. Scene set to repeat as the arm of St. Francis tours this country. David Common, CBC News, Ottawa. Wow. The relic officially begins its Canadian tour tomorrow in Quebec City's Notre Dame Basilica. Over the next month, though, it will take in 14 towns and cities across eight provinces. So you might get a chance to see it. Stops will include the University in Anaganish, Nova Scotia, that bears Francis Xavier's name. As 2018 begins, there are, as you know, dangers lurking in the wider world. It's extremely profitable. All they have to do is create one little program and just send it out to as many people as they can. One of those dangers struck for the first time last year, wreaking havoc in several countries, and it's now a much bigger menace. Find out why when our panel reveals what worries them most about the new year. The world will 
inevitably go through some big changes this year, some potentially frightening. None will be isolated to one country or one region, so we have enlisted a little help in breaking down the big issues. Stephanie Carvin teaches at the School of International Affairs at Carleton University. Joseph Wong is a professor at the University of Toronto and Monk School of Global Affairs. And joining us from San Francisco, Jeremiah Grossman, who is Chief of Security Strategy at Sentinel One and a professional hacker. So, you know, Jeremiah, these foreign affairs discussions don't always involve a cybersecurity expert, but it, it only took a little bit of homework to realize we had to have you on, and here's why. These are just some of the big companies in the last year which were either hacked or had data exposed. The number of people potentially affected, more than 200 million. So, Jeremiah, that was last year. There are all sorts of people predicting this year the cyber threat will be even more acute. What, what's your read of that? Absolutely. Every trend that we see in cybersecurity as far as breaches and break-ins is going up. And for the very simple fact that from the adversary's perspective, whether they're nation states or cyber criminals, is this type of crime works, and it works very well. On a practical level, though, I mean, what's this going to mean for companies and people at home who, you know, might be slightly panicking about their devices? Well, I hope they wouldn't panic, but there are two types of uh, victims in the world when it comes to cybercrime. You can be either a target of opportunity or a target of choice. Most of us on the Internet, and there's about two billion, two billion people online right now, all of us are going to be a target of opportunity, meaning if our security is a little bit less than normal, we're probably going to get hacked and we're probably going to have some losses. But if you're the large corporations or key individuals, you're going to be a target of choice. And nation states and cyber criminals, they, they have something, you have something that they want. Okay, so Stephanie, I mean, the, I think the obvious question for Canada is what's your sense of how ready this country is? I think there's consensus that Canada is probably not ready. And, you know, we've seen the government already try to take steps to improve information sharing. And, you know, in the last two years, they've conducted a review and a consultation on where the cyber policy should go. But the fact is our cyber policy was brought out in 2010. It, it's pretty outdated. So in 2018, what we're going to be seeing is the Liberal government has put forward new national security legislation that will actually allow it to defend designated critical infrastructure. Uh, and it's also going to be bringing out a new cyber policy um, that's hopefully going to address some of the things that Jeremiah is talking about. But really, in the end, um, you know, how this strategy is going to be funded, how it's going to protect, you know, small, medium enterprises or even the average Canadian citizen remains to be seen because it, it is a daunting task. Okay, so cheerful. Very cheerful. Uh, <laughs> Joseph, I mean, when we, when we talk about uh, the cyber threat, I, I understand the sort of the personal and professional threat, but obviously there's a, there's a threat to democracies mm -hmm. here too. What's your read of, of the state of those threats? Well, I think cyber, cyber technology, cyber security raises the, is, is sort of the leading edge of a larger issue of technology, information, and transparency. And so, you know, currently we're in the era of truthfulness, fake news, and so on. And so when you have cybersecurity breaches, invariably people start to wonder, you know, how real is the information we're getting? And if there's anything at the core of democracy, it's about transparent information. And we see the distortion of this. Um, we see it in the United States. We see it all around the world. And we see it in, frankly, very fragile democracies around the world today. So you're looking at a couple of elections probably this yeah. year that, that are worrying to you? Elections, but also just day-to-day -day politics. So for instance, um, you know, in Myanmar, uh, we know, the rest of the world knows uh, what's going on now in terms of the uh, Rohingya Muslims. Um, but you know, when you're in Myanmar, the government will say, look, that's fake news, right? This is distorted news. This isn't really going on, or you don't really have the real story. Uh, and in many ways, that's undermining what was once a very promising young democracy. Right, so that's, that's a real threat. Mm -hmm. We cannot talk about cyber attacks without mentioning North Korea. Uh, not long ago, the Hermit Nation was blamed for one of last year's biggest attacks. After careful investigation, the United States is publicly attributing the massive WannaCry cyber attack to North Korea. The United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and Japan have seen our analysis, and they join us in denouncing North Korea for WannaCry. If by chance you forgot what WannaCry is, here's a refresher. Last May, the ransomware infected more than 400,000 machines in 150 countries, locking out and extorting huge businesses like FedEx and shutting down hospitals across the UK's National Health Service. Jeremiah, this, this one is for you. What is North Korea up to here? Is, is it just about being obstructionist or is there more to it? The first thing to understand is that ransomware, if there's 
any one particular narrative, ransomware took over in the last year. It's very easy and it's very profitable. And for North Korea, which makes them a little bit different than many other nation states who hack for state-sponsored or national security reasons, North Korea is under sanction and they need to generate revenue. And what the North Koreans seem to have figured out is that they can use cyber criminal tactics like ransomware to generate large amounts of revenue for whatever causes that they see fit. Is that actually working? I mean, is North Korea actually making good money off this? Uh, it all depends on what good money is. Are they making um, millions? Absolutely. Are they making billions? It's hard to say, but somewhere in between there. The one thing that we can say for certain is that they're not going to stop and others are going to continue following suit because it works. Okay, I, I guess when we think about the threat from North Korea, it's probably not the cyber threat. It, it's the nuclear one. So 2018, Joseph, what are we looking at there? Well, I, the North Koreans are not going to be slowing down uh, in any way their nuclear uh, development. Um, you know, the thing is, with when you're playing the nuclear game, the key is deterrence, right? And in order to have uh, deterrence, you need credible players. And I think in many ways, Kim Jong-un um, in North Korea doesn't present itself as a credible player. The challenge, however, is that the other player in the game, which is the United States, is increasingly portraying itself as well as not being a particularly credible player. So this is... You know, this is a very dangerous game, and this is why you see experts, uh, prognosticators, you know, predicting anywhere between 30 and 70 percent chance that this may escalate into some conflict. And Stephanie, I mean, we talked about deterrence, but I guess when you're talking about a threat like this, it's either you contain it, uh, you negotiate your way out of it, or you attack. What's your sense of which one of those we're going to be talking about the most this year? I think we're going to be looking at all three, if only because there seems to actually be a division even within the United States as to which action um, they should be taking. Uh, for example, you have Rex Tillerson at the State Department who's saying, you know, or seems to be advocating for more diplomacy. Uh, on the other hand, you have um, those who are actually pushing for a strike, uh, including, I think, the president. That seems to be where he wants to take this. And I think, you know, as Joe said, the fact is the, the chances of war are probably far larger than most people realize. For sure. Uh, given how the United States is handling this issue so far, others are turning to China. But will it rise to the occasion? We know China is worried. Reports earlier this month cited a leaked document suggesting China is building refugee settlement points near its border with North Korea. The worry, thousands fleeing a possible war. You know, China has not confirmed the camp's existence. Joe, what is China actually expecting? And is it your sense that... Second question, really. Is it your mm. sense that this is the year that, that China picks up possibly from where the United States may leave off in terms of foreign aid and foreign involvement? Uh, well, it's clear that China is preparing itself for uh, what could be conflict. Um, and this is, this is very telling. I mean, if you think back just, I don't know, a decade ago in the Six Nations talks, the, the, the role that China was playing was much more of a diplomatic role, right? We were really leveraging its potential diplomacy. Now what we're thinking about is actually China's on-the-ground uh, role in terms of any sort of military action. This reflects, I think, uh, and this is to your second question, and I think this reflects just a changing um, worldview uh, within Beijing and with China's role uh, on the global stage and also how the rest of the world sees China. This is a moment for China. I mean, recently during the APEC summit, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, spoke about free trade, about the global community, about a global commons. The president, on the other hand, you know, spoke about how the world, uh, you know, free trade is important, but, you know, there are some countries that are cheating it and so on. So, you know, from the rest of the world's point of view, China is actually standing up now as a global leader, um, whereas the United States seems to be retreating from that kind of historical role, at least in the post-war era. Okay, so we're almost wrapping up here. If mm. I can just note, we've gone through 10 minutes and have not said Donald Trump's name once. Just, okay, once. <laughs> okay. I just did. But right. uh, now, if we can, let's turn to a bit of a lightning round. Yeah. The left field story that has really got you a bit obsessed, I I'm going to jump in and go first here. For me, it's that at the end of 2017, China stopped taking uh, the world's recycling. Right. And that's a big deal. 80% of Halifax's recycling goes to China. <laughs> did go to China, 60% of the province of Quebec's recycling. So f for me, I'm watching this one because this is going to force a lot of countries in the developed world to decide what, the, what to do with their waste, either 
find a new buyer for it or maybe a new way of coping with it. I, I, I kind of think that that's a decision far away that's going to hit here at home. Mm -hmm. But Jeremiah, can I toss this lightning round to you? Sure. Um, the one story that I've been looking at is that I spend most of my time in cybersecurity and specifically cybercrime. Over the last two years, as we've talked about, ransomware has been taking over. And the way that works is that the extortion is paid in the cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. And there was a very particular uh, ransomware family uh, about two years ago that was making between one and $300,000 per day for 100 days in Bitcoins. That was at a time where Bitcoin was worth under $1,000 per Bitcoin. Today, now those Bitcoin wallets are now worth other than hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions, now they're worth billions. My question is, what happens when, our, when cyber criminals have access to billions of dollars in capital to further their campaigns? Oh, okay, fair enough. Joseph. Um, so I was recently at a conference in Japan, uh, and the World Bank announced something I thought was really interesting. One of the things that they're keen on doing, actually, is tying together countries' credit ratings with the amount they're investing in health and education. In other words, your credit worthiness is going to be based on your government's commitment to raising the, the lives and increasing the prosperity of those who are poor. That could fundamentally change how we do global development. Okay, very quickly, Stephanie. What's, what's um, I, on, to end on a slightly negative note, I would say Russia is going to be a continuing story in 2018. Um, how are they going? Are they going to continue to interfere in the elections in the United States in 2018? But also, Canada has taken steps which have certainly angered uh, Vladimir Putin in terms of signing the Magnitsky Act, which put sanctions on his friends, and also now selling lethal arms to Ukraine. So, will there be retaliation from Russia in some kind of creative way? Wow, you're all so optimistic. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Joseph Wong, Stephanie Carvin, Jeremiah Grossman, thank you. Lots to look forward to indeed. Well, coming up, how a 37-year-old woman trapped in her own body spoke to her mother for the first time in decades. Next on The National. Technology has grown and it has caught up to her and now she can shine like that Christmas star. I'm proud of her. She's gonna make it. Cause she was trapped in her body and I knew that right after the accident. She knows now what she has to do. Joellen Huntley suffered catastrophic brain damage in a car accident more than two decades ago. Since 1996, she's relied on others for her most basic needs. She's unable to speak or write. But Huntley's silence is beginning to lift. Tom Murphy explains how. I saw you looking at your yes-no board. It's all in the eyes. See those tiny movements? A special camera on Joellen Huntley's tablet oh, tracks them. No, the white so dot, scared. that represents the reflection from her eyes. The software reads their movement, matches it with the pre-programmed images. What do you want to wear today, Joe? For more than 21 years, Joellen has not spoken. Now this. I want to wear a long-sleeved shirt. <laughs> it's what Joellen Huntley's family believes is finally meaningful communication. I put a song on and I danced around the computer with a chair with her. Joellen Huntley was a teenager when she suffered severe brain injury in a car accident back in 1996. Trapped in her own body, Joellen's speech pathologist believes she now has a voice. For right now, she's using pictures to communicate. Um, there are alphabet boards built into her system where she could eventually go in and spell. Um, a specific message on her own or choose a pre-programmed message. Here's the thing. This isn't the first time that perseverance has paid off for Joellen Huntley and her family. Just a few years ago, they had to go to court to battle the provincial government when it tried to claw back the insurance payments of close to $1.5 million. They said it was to compensate taxpayers who pay for her care. After public outrage, the province dropped the case and negotiated a confidential deal with the family. Some of that money went to buy this technology, which has been around for about a decade and has been used by patients across Canada. She's shooting for the stars, everything, anything's possible now. It's not clear how much more it will help Joellen, but hope is a word people around here are using a lot these days. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Waterville, Nova Scotia.
It was one of last summer's major Canadian stories, the flood of asylum seekers crossing into Quebec from the United States. Over 20,000 made the journey by year's end, and it seems all those new arrivals could prove to be a boon. Quebec is facing a major labour shortage. As Alison Northcott reports, all those asylum seekers could help plug up some of the gaps. For Francois Bonheur, this is part of building a new life in Canada. He's applying for a job, one of nearly 100 recent asylum seekers at this recruiting session for a meat processing company held at Montreal's Haitian Community Centre. If I have some money, I buy the house, you know, I want to take care of bill, whatever, you know. Um, uh, example, I don't have a car for now, so I need a car, whatever, and then if I'm work, I know I take care of everything. As they wait for immigration hearings to determine if their refugee claims are accepted, some asylum seekers have gotten work permits from the federal government and are looking to enter the labour market. It was that more than I thought it would be. We, we thought 45 had um, actually confirmed their presence and so we got doubled at. They're ready to hit the ground running. They're, they're ready to, to feel uh, autonomous, uh, empowered. Quebec is in the midst of a labour shortage with companies across several sectors searching for workers. We need 580 people. To and some employers like the poultry and pork processing company Olimel see the recent wave of asylum seekers in Quebec as an opportunity. They need uh, money, of course, to, uh, for their living and uh, they need a, a work. And if they got a, a work permit, of course, we're very interested in, the, in those people because they're very, they're really motivated and uh, they really want to work. The company recently chartered this bus to its turkey plant east of Montreal. On board, about 20 applicants, most of them asylum seekers originally from Haiti, like Junior Amizial. He says he arrived in Canada from the U.S. with no money and is eager to get off of social assistance and start a life for his family here. At the plant, Amizial has his interview, uh, highlighting his experience doing similar work. The jobs on offer at Olimel's plants are full-time permanent positions. The plants are unionized, but the work is hard and can include slaughtering or processing poultry or pork in a cold factory that's often a trek from Montreal. Still, Amizial says he just wants to work. You have to be very patient. Some community organizers say they're following the recruitment process closely, recognizing that asylum seekers' uncertain status can make them vulnerable to exploitation. This is why when we accept to, 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 to cooperate with the companies is because we, we, we are sure that the, the, the conditions are good and the, 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 the pay is good and the conditions are good. For Jude La Fortune, the wait for work is over. He was hired at the turkey plant. La Fortune crossed the border from the U.S. into Canada with his family this summer. Wow, super. <laughs> wow. His second child was born here soon after. Je veux contribuer. I want to contribute, he says, and sees this job as a stepping stone to a life in Canada. But like many others, he has to wait for his immigration hearing to find out if he will be allowed to live and work here long term. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Saint Jean Baptiste, Quebec. The Canadian artist and inventor Bill Lishman died over the weekend at age 78. His name may not really ring a bell, but a lot of people will remember what he did. He taught birds to fly with him and eventually led some to reconnect with their migratory paths. Hollywood told his story in 1996 in the movie Fly Away Home. Here's Bill Lishman in his own words explaining just how he did it. Actually, I played the sound of the aircraft engine tape recording to them when they were in the egg, so they, 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 they were accustomed to that sound right from day one, you might say. Then as they grew up, uh, it's just giving them lots of tender love and care. You talk to them every day and take them for walks, and well, then when they got big enough to walk a little bit faster, we'd taxi the airplane and they'd run along behind it, and, and gradually as they evolved their wings, uh, we all flew together. I never thought it was going to work, but the day it worked, it was fabulous. I just say I'm an artist. And then they said, what kind of art? I said, well, my lifestyle is my art. And, uh, you know, flying with the birds is a form of art.
On The National Tonight, officials in New York are investigating after another fire in the Bronx. It broke out this morning at a four-story apartment building. At least 23 people were hurt, including one firefighter. No word yet on the cause, but the fire is believed to have started in a furniture store on the ground floor. Just a couple days ago, 12 people were killed in an apartment fire in the same area. Centers it for Howden. He tapped that wide. Contois back on it. A jam play score. And with that, Team Canada is off to the next round at the World Junior Championships. They trounced Switzerland today with a final score of 8-2. to two. They faced the Czech Republic in semifinal action on Thursday. The Olympic dream of Canadian skeleton racer Evan Neufeld is back on track tonight. The Saskatoon athlete's $15,000 customized sled vanished en route to Europe last week, leaving Neufeld fearing his lost luggage would mean a lost shot at glory. But tonight, he's smiling again, and it's our moment of the day. In transfer, I, uh, I came through Toronto, and the bag just didn't make it to the next flight. So it's not the first time, and it's not the last time. There's so many things. My saddle is specifically built to my rib cage. Like there's, there's a lot of work that goes into fine tuning over the years, uh, the sled to, to make it your friend. So Air Canada went to work and uh, within 72 hours they found it. And within the next 12 hours it was in Europe. So uh, quite amazing. I kind of uh, climbed on top of it in its box and just had a big hug. We have one more day of training, so I will uh, make the most of those two minutes on the track. Wow, and here I, I get upset when the airlines lose my jeans and t-shirts. Never mind my <laughs> Olympic dreams. So he's pretty level-headed about it. <laughs> yeah, there is no Kijiji for a, a sled where the saddle fits your rib cage, whatever that means. No, but he did say that the other guys or the other competitors were lending their sled. So that's sort of the Olympic spirit already. <laughs> there you go. That's the national for January 2nd. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.